Welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jefferson Knight. I've been a lawyer here in Miami for longer than I care to admit. Uh, I am the new president of the Federalist Society, uh, the Miami Lawyers Chapter. Uh, this is our fourth program. We're proud to state for calendar year 2012. And uh, I'm not sure that's a record. We've had about four programs a year for the last couple of years. We're proud of that. And we've now got a pretty good track record as one of the more active lawyers chapters in the United States. There are about 60 lawyers chapters around the country. The Federalist Society is strictly nonpartisan, serves as a forum for um, voicing ideas on matters of public policy, and particularly law, of course. And many of our activities expose people who might not otherwise be exposed to, and this is written by somebody else, but it's very well put, basic principles of limited constitutional government, separation of powers, individual freedom, and the rule of law. And we encourage you to become a member if you're not already. You don't have to be a conservative or a libertarian. There are many benefits to membership. Um, there are brochures outside. You can uh, send in a check by snail mail. And if you're a lawyer, guess what? It's only 50 bucks. That's a value that's very hard to beat, particularly if you compare it to the Dade County Bar Association, which was a couple of hundred dollars. We have several members of the judiciary here today. We always like to recognize them. We have from the county court, we have my little code here, Gladys Perez, uh, judge-elect Yvonne Cuesta, congratulations to her. Don. <laughs> judge Don Cohn. Judge Fleur Lobrie. From the federal bench, we have Judge Robert Scola, around here somewhere. And also Judge Paul Hook. Paul Jr. was supposed to be here, but uh, I haven't seen him. If, uh, many of you know Paul, and somebody was looking for him. So uh, if you see Paul. <laughs> Is he in trouble again? And from the circuit court bench, we have Lester Langer. <laughs> Celeste Muir. Jackie Scola. And Maria Korvik. I mentioned Christian earlier from the Canadian Consulate, and in addition, we have from the Florida Legislature, Matt Hudson. <laughs> Matt's district includes uh, eastern Collier County and the entirety of Hendry County. If you look it up on the map, it's some really beautiful country. I've hunted in some of it. <laughs> I think I've listed everybody. Uh, <laughs> If there's anybody I've left out, you can let me know later. Um, I want to thank the panel members, Professor Fitzpatrick uh, and from Vanderbilt, where I went to undergraduate school, past, immediate past president of the Florida Bar, Scott Hawkins, and our moderator, who many of you know, Alex Acosta from FIU Law School. And speaking of immediate past presidents, you didn't. You kind of broke my stride there, but I wanted to say a few words about our immediate past predecessor, uh, president, my predecessor, Judge Ariana Fajardo. She is the newest appointee. <laughs> is she popular? <laughs> Pop quiz: Who recruited Ariana Fajardo to the Federalist Society? Me. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's one of my more proud accomplishments. Uh, I met her about four years ago. I was very impressed by her, her intelligence, her demeanor, her, uh, committing, uh, her commitment to, as she says, do the right thing. Once I introduced her to her group a couple of years ago, I noted her past as a prosecutor, 
and I said that she liked putting people in jail, which I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> but um, she got up and reintroduced herself, and she corrected me. She says, uh, Jefferson is not correct. I did not enjoy putting people in jail. What I did enjoy is doing the right thing. That's a phrase I've heard her use many times uh, before and since then. Uh, so needless to say, I'm extremely proud of her. And uh, she uh, was president of this chapter for not quite two years. And a lot of people don't know it, but for an entire year before that, she worked tirelessly doing things that are mundane but needed to be done, things like updating the mailing list, the email list. She called me on a Saturday morning and she said, you just volunteered. <laughs> and if you know Judge Fajardo, you know that uh, uh, when she asks you to do something, generally you don't say no. And I'm also reminded of um, something that um, uh, third court, third circuit, excuse me, third district court of appeal, Leslie Rothenberg, a good friend of ours, said, and Ariana has known her for, for many, many years. She said at the at the investiture of Angie Zayas, who's also diminutive in stature, and Leslie Rothenberg says those are two of her favorites, Judge Zayas and Judge Fajardo. She likes them in particular because they're both smaller than she is. <laughs> and she said, with regard to both of them, wonderful, great things come in tiny packages. Um, and in connection with and to recognize Judge Fajardo's service to this particular chapter, we have a plaque to present to her. I thought maybe Dina Costa took it. <laughs> the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies to Judge Ariana Fajardo. How do you say your name, Anna? in recognition of her distinguished service as president of the Miami Lawyers Chapter. Oh, I should say, you might have noticed this is being DVD'd. Uh, soon after she took the bench, she was uh, doing bond hearings, and she had occasion to appear on, a, on TV in a high-profile case during the bond hearings. Everybody noticed how photogenic she was, so uh, she'll be taking over from here on out because it's being recorded. <laughs> Thank you all. So the first thing I said to my predecessor, President George Perez, I said, boy, I'm so glad it's not me speaking at that podium because I don't think I could see over it. <laughs> I just, as uh, Judge Shepard wisely would remind me before each of these events, you're not here to hear us speak, you're here for the panel. So the only thing I wanna say is thank you for allowing me to take on the leadership for these two years and for continuing to attend and continuing to lend myself to the tradition of the Federalists. And I so enjoyed it and so enjoyed working with all of you. And I just thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve. I had occasion to introduce Ariana to many people, including people in Miami, people in Tallahassee, people in Washington, and after they got to know her, they all said the same thing. They said, Jeff, we like her better than you. <laughs> but I knew that would happen. Um, giving credit where credit is due, this program probably would not be taking place were it not for Jennifer Guy here in the front row. Jennifer is a friend for many years. Um, we keep in touch. She's mostly in Tallahassee, also in Naples a lot these days. And uh, she and Tom Spencer and I and other people had a dialogue in the spring. We talked about the possibility of something like this. And I said, Jennifer, there's not enough time. There's not enough interest. We really probably shouldn't do it. Well, Jennifer, thank goodness, did not listen to me. She forged ahead and she helped us put together this program. And actually, I went back to Jennifer, circling back and saying, hey, Jennifer, you're right. Let's do something. And she arranged for Professor Fitzpatrick from Vanderbilt. And I don't know if you know, saw the handouts. There's a similar program in Tallahassee next month. She was right. There's a lot of public interest here. And it should be the issues we're going to be talking about tonight are significant issues of public policy. That's why Matt Hudson is here, right, Matt? Also, Tom Spencer, I can't remember if I mentioned Tom, he was one of the people in on the conversations and uh, without Tom's assistance, it might not have happened. And also, Claudia Murray, Claudia's here somewhere. She might be down the hall, you might have met her checking in. She has done a lot of the legwork uh, and it's very hard to imagine unless you've done it. I know Judge Fajardo knows exactly how, and Judge Perez knows exactly how much time it takes. 
Our moderator tonight is Alex Acosta. Many of us know Dean Acosta. Uh, proud to call him our friend. He has a very interesting bio. I knew some of it, but not all of it before I looked him up. He's a native of uh, Miami. He went to Gulliver High School and he got into Harvard, went to Harvard Law School as well. Judge Huck is also an alumnus, I believe, from Harvard. He clerked uh, to Judge Justice Samuel Alito in the United States Supreme Court uh, before he was on the Supreme Court, I believe. And he taught, and I did not know this until I looked him up, not only uh, at FIU Law School, where he's taught courses in innocence and labor law at the George Mason School of Law. Um, and he was a member of the NLRB, having been confirmed by the Senate. Later on, he was assistant attorney general at the DOJ. And he became the longest serving United States attorney in South Florida since the 1970s, which reminds me that it's not his first uh, appearance. Hello, Rocky, how are you? Uh, Rocky Rodriguez, good friend, former general counsel to Jeb Bush. Um, Uh, about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, Dina Costa was a panel member uh, for a panel that was dreamed up by another former U.S. attorney, uh, Marcos Jimenez. And Marcos and Ariana put that together, and it was in a panel looking back 10 years, 10 years post 9-11. And all featured were all the uh, former U.S. attorneys, including Dina Costa, and looking back, 9-11 is obviously 11 years ago today, how that affected the federal practice, how it affected the law practice in the uh, Southern District of Florida. 9-11 obviously touched many of us and continues to do so. And uh, we could go on and on. We're probably a little behind schedule. That's my fault. And uh, I'll go ahead and get Dean Acosta to uh, take over from here. And again, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jefferson. Um, you know, it occurred to me that this is 9-11, and uh, before, before we go on, um, I just wanted to say I, I think this is an appropriate topic for tonight because uh, in a lot of ways, uh, I think it's appropriate to dedicate this to the memory of 9-11 because um, the judiciary is so important to our legal system. The rule of law is what makes us different from other countries, uh, what really protects our freedom. And uh, in, in the end, 9-11 was an attack on that system of laws, on that freedom. And, and so I just wanted to, uh, with your permission, uh, mention that and at least acknowledge and dedicate um, uh, that today is September 11th. Um, I'd like to introduce the panel members. Um, and then I'd like to, uh, they're going to speak briefly. I'd like to pose a question. And then um, we'll take some questions from the audience. With us tonight, we have Scott Hawkins. Uh, many of you know him. He's vice chair of Jones, Foster, Johnson, and Stubb uh, over on the far left. Uh, he's past president of the Florida Bar. He's a member of the ABA's House of Delegates and uh, past president of the Palm Beach County Bar Association. Uh, he's listed in Best Lawyers in America, Super Lawyers, uh, all the plethora of uh, Florida magazines, and uh, is, is one of the, 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 the real, um, uh, the real specialists, uh, bar certi uh, board certified in business litigation and uh, in commercial litigation, and um, is not only a specialist, but is a, a deeply uh, honored and, and well-known uh, individual within the Florida Bar. So Scott, thank you for being with us today. Uh, Scott uh, authored recently a law review piece that was published in the uh, Florida Law Review entitled Perspectives on Judicial Merit Retention in Florida. And um, before introducing our second speaker, I want to uh, mention how he opened it. He opened it with a quote from Chief Justice John Marshall. And the quote was, the greatest scourge in angry heaven ever inflicted upon an ungrateful and sinning people was an ignorant, a corrupt, or a dependent judiciary. Um, and it struck me that that's a very appropriate quote to open a law review piece with, hearkening back to the Chief Justice and, 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 and to, to John Marshall of all individuals, you know, the Chief Justice, not a Chief Justice. But in a sense, everyone's going to agree with that. Um, we don't want ignorant judges, we don't want corrupt judges, and we don't want dependent judges. And, and so I think that's almost too easy, because the real question is, 
what is a dependent judge, what is, and, and at what point does independence become too great a cost because you don't have a system to check ignorance or corruption. Um, in other words, to put it in, in, in the voice of our framers, we want judges that exercise judgment, not will, hearkening back to Hamilton. Um, but what is judgment to one person can be will to another person. And so what is dependence to one can be independence to another. And so I wanted to, to sort of pull that um, from Mr. Hawkins' law review piece because I, I think that really does set up uh, a, a little bit of what today is about. This is a very difficult question because depending on your perspective of what the role of a judge is, there are different views on what is appropriate and inappropriate in a, a judicial system that has retention. Um, with us, uh, we have uh, tonight also a scholar uh, who wrote a, and I think this is so appropriate because he also wrote a law review piece. His is in the Virginia Law Review on the history of state judicial selection and tenure. And he talks about how in the days of our founders, judges weren't elected like they are now. They were primarily appointed and, and how that really sets up a slightly different system. Uh, he's Brian Fitzpatrick. He's an associate professor of law at Vanderbilt. Um, he, uh, he also attended Harvard. He clerked on the Ninth Circuit for Judge Dermot O'Scanlan, um, and then went on to clerk for, for Justice Scalia on the U.S. Supreme Court. He served as an Olin Fellow and worked on the um, uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, working for Senator Cornyn. So, uh, Professor Fitzpatrick, thank you for joining us. <laughs> With that, Mr. Hawkins. Do you need the microphone to be used for recording? Well, first, may it please the court, Judge Fajardo, that's directed to you. Congratulations Thank you. on being elected to a constitutional office, I guess appointed. Uh, second of all, I want to say that my remarks are not the official remarks of the Florida Bar. So please do not construe what I say as representing uh, some official pronouncement of Florida Bar views or policies. And thirdly, I'm not here to advocate a particular position regarding the current system or regarding a particular judge or justice on the November ballot. I am here, however, to um, talk with you about what I've learned regarding merit retention, having just finished my term as president of the Florida Bar. And I want to thank George Perez and a number of you in here for helping me early on. Uh, Carlos Guzman, who helped me get exposed to various folks as I was campaigning in Miami back in 2009. Uh, we made a decision, we being the Board of Governors of the Florida Bar, in 2010 and 2011, to have a study done of what the electorate understands regarding judicial merit retention. So we commissioned a, a public relations firm based in North Florida with some offices in Central Florida to conduct focus group research. Now I'm going to ask you, what percentage do you think of the average person who participated in the focus group research? Several groups were, were canvassed. Orlando, Tallahassee, elsewhere. What percentage of those who participated expressed an understanding where they affirmatively said, I understand what judicial merit retention is about? Five is a good guess. Anyone else? One percent is a good guess. The answer was less than 10 percent. In other words, 90 percent of those who participated in the focus group exercise, I wasn't involved, the board was not involved, we asked neutrals to conduct this, expressly affirmed they did not understand what judicial merit retention was about. We concluded, therefore, that there is a huge lack of understanding regarding judicial merit retention. And in our sessions around the state, and in, in my speeches around the state last year, 
I came to learn that not only is there a great lack of understanding about judicial merit retention, and I want to commend Richard Levenstein, who's a former vice chairman of the Constitutional Judiciary Committee of the Florida Bar, which led that study, but I learned that not only is there a great lack of understanding about judicial merit retention, there is frankly a great lack of understanding about what judges do. Think about it. If you haven't been through litigation in our society, and uh, God forbid you have to go through litigation, but if you, go th if you haven't been through it, you've never really actually stopped to ponder, you know, how do I apply a burden of proof? Or if, you're, if, you're a, if you've never actually had, a, had an appeal, what does it mean to say to someone, well, you realize what can be argued on appeal is based on what was judicial error was preserved. What does that mean? Or what's confined in the record? What does that mean? These are difficult, arcane, erudite questions that we have to grapple with as lawyers day in and day out. But the, the point being that it's very difficult, in my judgment, from what I've heard, and I haven't read empirical studies on this, and I'm sure Professor Fitzpatrick is much more well-versed on this, but from what I've seen and heard, the average person simply doesn't have a great, real bedrock understanding of what judges do day in and day out. So if they don't have that great bedrock understanding, how can an electorate be asked to assess whether someone should merit continuation in office? It's a fair question, I think. But I'm not suggesting they shouldn't have the right to assess. What I'm suggesting is, is that the system we have today has a lot of opportunities for misinformation, a lot of opportunities for labeling judges particular ways in a system where judges really can't defend themselves. You label Judge Hawkins an, an activist. I can't really explain, you know, why I've ruled the way I've ruled. And I'll, and I'll give you a confession. I'm a moderate Republican. So that's my orientation. I'm all about balance and moderation and how I view the world. That's my perspective. But if you attacked me as an activist and I'm a judge, I can't defend myself. I can't explain, oh, I decided my ruling three years ago on the fourth DCA a certain way. We don't permit that. So what we need to think about is how do we enhance the level of understanding and communication uh, to the electorate regarding these very precious offices like Judge Fajardo has succeeded to, succeeded to, constitutional officers. A very vital role in our democracy, and, and I'm not suggesting voters shouldn't have a right to vote. What I'm suggesting is, is that our system, and our system has functioned fairly effectively now for 36 years, and our system was put in place by what mechanism? Does anybody know? The voters in Florida chose to amend the Florida Constitution in 1976 and to put in place the system that we have today, which is operated under seven different governors, Democratic and Republican. Now, I'm going to ask you one last thing. The, the, the title is Perspective on Has the System Measured Up? Has anybody read the book, uh, A Disorderly Court? Okay, Richard, of course, Richard's read it. Disorderly Court. Disorderly Court is a book that was written by a journalist from the St. Pete Times named Martin Dykeman. And the court studied scandals in Florida, the Florida High Court, in the late 60s and the early 70s. Anybody know here we had a justice indicted? We had justices who were receiving briefs improperly, not spread across the entire panel. Uh, there's even some evidence that justices were attempting to reach judges on the appellate court below to talk about what was on the docket and how certain things might bubble up their way. Th these are facts that were documented by Mr. Dykeman in his book called The Disorderly Court. Now, why do I bring that up? That was the backdrop. That was the milieu that led to voters overwhelmingly choosing to amend the Florida Constitution in 1976 to put in place our current system of merit selection and merit retention. Merit selection is the process in place where members of judicial nominating commissions come together when a seat opens and seek to vet candidates and then make nominations to the governor for the circuit bench and the district court of appeal bench and for 
the Supreme Court, just like Justice Lewis, who is from here, and one of the justices on the November ballot for retention. Merit selection is based on, you know, a nine-member commission choosing whether or not certain nominees merit being nominated to the governor. Merit retention, which is the back end of the merit process, gives voters an opportunity under Article 5 of the Florida Constitution, voters are given an opportunity to cast a vote every six years on whether a judge or justice merits being retained in office. It's a system that the voters selected to put in place. Uh, now you tell me of a scandal regarding judicial corruption since 1976. Yeah, there have been some outliers, of course. And the JQC process in Florida is very aggressive at addressing judges who misbehave. But I'm talking about the type of scandal that, that riddled our high court in the late 60s, which led to the system we have today. I'm communicating this with passion because I've been talking about it for the last 12 months as just re finishing my term of office. Uh, President like Gwen Young, President Gwen Young and President like Gene Pettis are continuing that effort across the state and many throughout the state of Florida, bar leaders, bar representatives, lawyers, non-lawyers are speaking out about this topic in the hopes of enhancing voter education. The program is called the Vote Senior Court. I, I look forward to the dialogue tonight. This is an extremely important topic and it's very important that each of you lead this room tonight with a better understanding of the vital role of this, of this vote and the vital role, the precious role that judges fulfill in our democracy and how, frankly, you are the best persons to talk to others about why their vote matters. Because the vote is in your court. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, President Hawkins, for those remarks, and thank you all for inviting me here today. Jeff, thank you for inviting me here today. It's a real pleasure and honor. It's a beautiful venue, and I enjoyed meeting many of you before the event. Um, you know, I'm not a Floridian, um, so I do not have intimate knowledge of your judges here in Florida, uh, but I have studied judicial selection um, for the past several years as a professor at Vanderbilt, and so I'd like to give you some um, general thoughts about uh, general, uh, judicial selection. And before we start talking about Florida's system, the merit selection system, I'd like to start with a story about the federal system. You know, we all know how federal judges are selected. The president nominates, the U.S. Senate confirms. Uh, well, what is less well known, perhaps, is that there was great debate um, at the Constitutional Convention about how federal judges should be selected. You know, some people just wanted the president to do it without any Senate confirmation. Some people wanted the House involved. Some people wanted a commission of some senators and the president. There was all kinds of, some people wanted elections. There were all kinds of proposals aired. And in the middle of this very heated debate at the convention about how best to select judges, Benjamin Franklin decided that uh, the convention needed some comic relief. And so he got up um, and he proposed a, a, another possibility. He said, let's cut the president out. Let's cut the Senate out. Let's cut the House out. Let's ask the legal profession to select federal judges. We'll be guaranteed to get the best judges that way, he said, because the lawyers will choose the best among them to be a judge because that way they can get him out of competition uh, <laughs> for cases and clients. And everyone at the convention did what you just did, and that's laugh. But I'm here to tell you today that Benjamin Franklin's joke is your reality. And it's the reality in, in many states across this country. Merit selection is selection by the legal profession. And I'm going to explain to you why, why I think that. Um, so merit selection uh, was um, an idea that was born in the progressive era um, about 100 years ago now. And like many progressive era ideas, it was based on the notion that the best government is a government run by experts. Experts. And the progressives thought, well, who are the experts when it comes to picking judges? Well, 
It must be the legal profession. They know better than anyone else what makes a good judge. So we will turn control of judicial selection over to the legal profession. And, it, and, and uh, merit selection does that in two ways. Both the merit selection and merit retention components empower the legal profession on the, um, over the uh, selection and retention of judges. First, on the merit selection component, the key player in selecting judges in these merit systems is the commission. The commission controls everything. The governor cannot pick someone unless the commission gives the governor the name. Now, who sits on the commission? Well, in many merit states, the commission is chock full of people that are picked not by the governor, not by the state senate, not by the state house, not by the voters, but by the bar. Uh, Florida is not as bad as some states, but it's no exception. Four of the nine spots on your commission are selected by the legal profession. So that gives almost half of the power over who your judges are to one special interest group, the legal profession. The rest of the people of this state get five spots. One special interest group gets four. Uh, that's a lot of power to the legal profession. It's not as bad in some, as some states give a, a majority to the, to the bar. You give four out of nine to the bar. Um, the retention vote. This, I think, solidifies the power of the bar over selection because it is virtually impossible to lose one of these retention elections. It's never happened in the state of Florida in all those years you've had merit system here. And that is not much of an aberration across the country. In Tennessee, we've had a merit system for 40 years. Only one judge out of 120 has ever lost. You look at the national statistics, 99% of the time judges running for retention win. That's an incumbent re-election rate unheard of anywhere else in the country, for any other office in the country. And the 99% number, you only get 1% to lose because you have the state of Illinois that requires a 60% vote to gain retention. Most of the judges who've lost have been in Illinois. Take them out, closer to 100 than you are to 99. Uh, it's impossible, it's almost impossible to lose one of these things and so you basically end up with judges who have been selected in large part by the legal profession that have life tenure. And that is a system, I think, of lawyers, by lawyers, and for lawyers. And it's no surprise that the bar associations love this system. It's for lawyers. It empowers lawyers compared to the alternatives of political appointment or, or elections. Now, I'm a lawyer. I have a lot of friends that are lawyers. I like lawyers. Just because we say that lawyers have control of things or a lot of control of things doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. But I think it is bad. And I'm going to explain why I think it's bad. Whether we like it or not, judges make law. We often like to say, no, judges just interpret the law, they just apply the law, the law is made by the legislature. That is a myth that we lawyers often try to sell to the public, but we know that it is not true. And, and when I say we lawyers, it includes people that I admire very much, like the Chief Justice of the United States, John Roberts, who gets up there in a Senate confirmation hearing and says, I just call balls and strikes. I'm just an umpire. Don't worry about me. <laughs> But we know that's not true. We know that's not true. Judges, especially in the state system, have the explicit power to make law through making common law. But they also have the implicit power to make law when they do everything else because the law, legal texts, legal sources are often ambiguous. And for a hundred years, ever since the legal realist movement, we have known that the law is often ambiguous, legal texts, legal sources run out, and something else has to fill up the gap. And consciously or subconsciously, the empirical evidence is in, judges consult their world views in filling up the gaps in getting to the finish line when there's ambiguity. They consult their world views. Judges who personally are quite politically conservative decide cases differently than the judges that are politically liberal. Not every case, 
But when there's disagreement, it's predictable on what side Justice Scalia is going to be on. It's predictable what side Justice Ginsburg is going to be on. The empirical evidence is in. Stacks and stacks of empirical evidence showing a judge's personal views affects, consciously or subconsciously, what they do on the bench. We may not like it, but I think it's a reality. I think it's a reality even if you're an originalist or a textualist. Sometimes history is going to be ambiguous. Sometimes the dictionary is going to be ambiguous. But I certainly think it's true if you're a living constitution, everything goes, jurist. There it's hard to do anything but consult your worldview. And so we have judges who are making law and consulting their worldviews. Now, we know this. We know this. We practice in front of the judges. We know. We see, we, we, we see their opinions. We know different judges mean different laws are going to be made. Um, now, the trouble with giving the bar control over selecting judges then is that whoever selects judges is going to care about what kind of laws are made. I mean, whoever selects them. If it's the governor, if it's the state senate, if it's the public, they're going to care whether gay marriage is constitutional or not, whether abortions are constitutional or not, whether tort reform is constitutional or not. People are going to care about the outcomes of cases. The public's going to care. The governor is going to care. Even the lawyers who sit on this commission are going to care what kind of laws are the judges in Florida are going to make. The, the lawyers who are on the commission may care more than anyone else, in fact. I mean, their livelihood, to some extent, depends on what these judges do. Um, and so the problem with giving lawyers control over the selection of judges is that you end up with a situation where lawyers are going to pick judges that make the kind of laws that lawyers like. And the kind of laws that lawyers like may not be the kind of laws that everyone else likes. There are some people out there, I don't know, you may think they're crazy, but some people out there that think that the legal profession is a little bit to the left of the general public on a lot of things. Now, I don't know what you're doing down here in Florida that you had a moderate Republican as the president of your bar. Haven't heard that before. <laughs> but as a general matter, I think most folks think that the legal profession is a little bit to the left of the general public. And if you have the legal profession picking judges, one concern is you end up with judges that are a little bit to the left of what they would be had they been picked by the governor picked by the political process, picked by the voters. Um, now, again, that doesn't mean that's necessarily good or bad. Maybe you like really liberal judges. In that case, merit selection is a good deal. But if you want judges that reflect more than just lawyers' views of what kind of law should be made, maybe um, a different system is better. Now, when we start asking the question, is a different system better, you know, one thing we have to ask ourselves is, OK, Perhaps you're right, Professor Fitzpatrick, that we're going to end up with judges that are accountable to the legal profession and not to the political process or to the public. Um, but aren't there maybe some benefits to merit selection that offsets what may be a cost in that regard? Well, there are some benefits to merit selection, and we need to consider them. But it turns out there's just not that many, and the few benefits there are are not that good. Um, so let me start with what I think was, in my own view, the biggest selling point for merit selection. That is, you're going to get smarter judges. As, as um, you know, President Hawkins said, the public doesn't know, um, you know th the law. They can understand the law. You know, maybe the governor has lawyers who could understand the law, uh, and therefore maybe he doesn't need the bar to tell him which people are good candidates. But the public certainly doesn't really understand the law very well. So you'd expect that merit systems lead to Smarter judges, better judges, judges who write crisper opinions, who do better legal research. Um, the political scientists have examined this question, and they find no evidence that the qualifications of judges, um, the performance of judges, is different depending on whether you elect them, for example, or use a merit system. Quality of school attended, number of years of experience as a lawyer, judicial experience, et cetera, et cetera. No difference in elected states versus merit states. Some um, law professors have looked at how often a judge's opinion is written, uh, is quoted in a different jurisdiction 
as a sign of quality. You know, if, if your opinion is cited in a different jurisdiction, it doesn't have to cite it, it's a sign of quality. And uh, these professors have found that elected judges, their opinions are cited more often than judges produced in merit states. Um, so there's no evidence about that. What about the question about politicking? Is this a sign that I need to move on? Um, in a few minutes, I want to make sure the time is Okay, I'm almost done. What about uh, the point about um, there's less politics in a merit system than some of the other systems? Um, it depends on what we mean by politics. You know, if we mean the judges consulting their own worldviews less frequently, I think that's wrong. I think judges, it's inevitable they're going to consult their worldviews all the time because the law is often ambiguous. Um, but I do think that merit selection has the potential to produce less politicking than other systems. I mean, certainly compared to contested elections, there's less politicking in merit systems, less fundraising. That's the big problem in elected um, contested elected systems is the fundraising. Although even here in Florida, I understand there's still quite a bit of fundraising going on here. Hundreds of thousands of dollars the Supreme Court justices are raising, leaving, leading to some of the same issues that you have in states with contested elections. Um, so maybe it's not a huge advantage over uh, the elected systems, but uh, even if it is an advantage, even if there is less politicking here than there is in contested elections, um, I don't see there's going to be any, there's no less politicking versus a system like the federal system where you have the governor appointing. I mean, there's no fundraising in that, in that kind of system. And, and so, you know, my own personal view is that a system like the federal system, where you have the governor appointing and the governor can rely on lawyers on his staff to help him. Um, the governor appointing without the legal profession tying the governor's hands, I think gets you something that's closer to the best of both worlds. You have a system that where the judges are going to be accountable to the governor who is himself accountable to the people. And you have a system where you're not going to have a lot of fundraising like you do in contested elections. And so I'm an advocate of the federal method of judicial selection. And I just want to add one last point uh, before I go, and that is I did want to say one thing about whether it's ever appropriate in the, in the merit retention aspect, whether it's ever appropriate for voters to vote a judge out of office because the voters don't like the judge's opinions. The voters don't like the judge's conclusions or outcomes that the judge has has come to in, in the judge's cases. And I think, of course, it's appropriate for the voters to consider whether they agree with the judge on whether abortion is a constitutional right or gay marriage or tort reform or this or that. Some things the voters can't figure out, granted, but some things they can. And I think it's perfectly appropriate for voters to consider those things. The judges are consulting their own worldviews and making those decisions. I don't think the voters should be denied the right to consult their worldviews when making those decisions as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor. But just for the record, I think you said governor when you went to say president a couple of times. The federal system. Yes. Technically, it's the president. Um, we're running late. However, historically, we've had a very engaged and inquisitive audience. I, it looks to me like it's exactly the same tonight. We want to have some questions. Dina Costa had an idea that I think is a good idea I hadn't thought of. His idea was to have the panelists stand up before the mic and field questions, and probably I'm the logical person to field. No, let's let the moderator do it. I've hogged enough time here. Um, but uh, I did want to throw out one idea, which I meant to mention earlier. You might have noticed, you're here by invitation, there are two versions of the invitation floating around. One I put together, sent to DC, came back a little different. The people in DC said the phrase, and this is something I'd never thought of, and I punished myself because I consider myself a thoughtful guy. The very phrase, merit retention, is a loaded phrase. Think about that. <laughs> As, uh, as I think about that, I think because it's being recorded, maybe if the three of us stand, you know, they'll also keep our answer short. Um, um, I, I have a question uh, for, for each to, to sort of you know, start the process. And I'll start with uh, President Hawkins. Um, it strikes me the, 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 there are a number of systems to deal with judges that are corrupt or who have misbehaved. And so if merit retention 
is to, uh, or if the retention system is to have some meaning, it needs to be something more than corruption. Because they're already, as you pointed out, a very aggressive JQC system and very aggressive means for dealing with that. So my question to you is, what is an appropriate basis for a voter to say, this is a judge that is not corrupt, this is a judge who is not dishonest, but also a judge who we do not wish to retain? Well, Dean Acosta, that's probably the hardest question that's presented by this vote. Uh, let me move back for a moment to say, in, in our system, Professor, in Florida, uh, the governor controls the JNC process. He has, or she, he ha they have five of the nine seats. So I realize your perspective is more of national in origin, but that system has been in place since Governor Jeb Bush, a Republican, instituted that system, I believe, under the leadership of the Council of uh, Rocky Rodriguez. Uh, okay, proceeded you. There's a legislature Yeah. So it used to be that we had, that the bar had uh, contributed three seats, the governor three seats, and those six seats pit, picked three more. But today the governor has five, and curiously, many of those appointed by the governor are lawyers not laypersons, presently under Governor Scott, for example. So I think that somewhat, you know, raises a question about your position that lawyers must be, um, must be biased because Republican governors are appointing lawyers to play a role on the JNC in the five-person majority. But I realize your comments were more of a national focus. The other thing I'd like to say is, um, we do have empirical evidence in Florida. I can't quote the numbers, but the greatest percentage of censure and discipline for judicial error and misbehavior relates to that population of lawyers who are elected. Now, I don't mean to suggest anything with somebody who was elected in this room, but if you analyzed the discipline uh, of judges over the last 10 years in Florida, the majority of those disciplined were elected to office. They came to office through the election process as opposed to an appointment by Governor Bush or by Governor Childs, for example. And just, you know, just to put it in perspective, um, if you look at our panel today on the high court, Justice Polston, Justice Kennedy would be emblematic of that Republican orientation, Judge Quince. Justice Quince was appointed by both Justice Bush and Childs, it was a joint appointment. Uh, others were appointed by Justice, by, Ju by Governor Childs. So, you know, the governor has the role there and the electorate has a chance to elect the governor. So in terms of the electorate having impact on what the governor chooses, you know, our system does presently contemplate that. And indeed, uh, Governor Childs had, I think, three or four appointments, very significant. So that may happen with Governor Scott, or that may happen with who succeeds Governor Scott. Uh, the, your question though, Dean Acosta, is how should voters assess merit? It's a very difficult question. The, the, the press- that, that, That's why I asked it. The press, <laughs> I mean, we, we, we tried to figure out how to uh, address this at the bar, and the major papers in the state essentially come down on the point that a, when judges are appointed under our system, they are presumably, if they're appointed, and they've gone through a rather rigorous vetting process, it's not as serious as Congress, but it's pretty rigorous. And if they're appointed, they're presumed to be uh, persons of merit. I mean, I think that's a safe presumption. And then they go up, and if, and if they haven't had a serious behavioral issue, if they haven't, um, if they haven't had a serious issue with uh, competence, performance, you know, sometimes we encounter judges who aren't able to keep up with the workload, um, then I, I think if there's not something to suggest that merit that, that allegedly went with them when they were appointed, I think there's a real question where they've lost their merit. Now, I realize that's a complicated way to answer your question. It does demonstrate how difficult this exercise is, but the major papers, the Herald, uh, 
the Sun Sentinel, the Post, the Tampa Tribune, they basically say, what is their reputation for competence? What is their reputation for work ethic? What is their reputation for fairness? What do lawyers say who actually appear before him? Not people who read about their rulings, but the people who day to day go to court. I gotta tell you, I've been in court a lot in the last 27 years. I don't think I've ever seen a constitutional provision overturned by a judge. In my, you know, I do a lot of corporate work, but I've never seen a sensational issue like you suggest. I know they're out there, but in the day-to-day -day work that trial lawyers do, they just aren't. You're looking for a judge who's mentally able, who's gonna be able to do the work, and is gonna do their best with integrity to do the job. And by and large, I think we have that, and I think Florida has an exceptional judicial bench, and we basically have that. I mean, in the end of the day, isn't that what we want as trial lawyers? But how do you, how do you assess it? It's a very difficult thing to explain. But I think it's a little naive to suggest I mean, I, I think there's merit to your point of election, I mean appointment, but I think it's simplistic to suggest that voters will ever give up their ability to vote. And uh, I understand that. It's bedrock to our democracy. People have an ability in this republic to express their views. The complicating, dangerous point is, how do we disseminate information fairly in a balanced manner that, that properly addresses a judge's merit. Very difficult to describe. It's a very challenging issue. So judicial misconduct light would be a fair summary? Competence. Um, Professor Fitzpatrick, I wanted to, uh, to, to direct a question in, in, you know, in, in your direction as well. I have a, uh, a newspaper article from the Miami Herald that discusses the situation involving Miami-Dade Circuit Judge David Miller. And what occurred in, in this situation is an attorney appeared before him and Judge Miller ruled against the attorney. Uh, he entered a verbal order. Um, before Judge Miller was able to, to translate the uh, verbal order into a written final order, the attorney announced that he was running against him, um, thereby causing a recusal issue, obviously. Um, so there was no final judgment. Um, and it appears from the, 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 the Miami Herald that the attorney ran against him simply because he lost the case. That is sort of the, the other extreme where uh, this individual um, uh, challenged a judge and, and uh, with the intent, I, I didn't win, and therefore I'm going to force an election which, um, which at least in, in, in South Florida is very expensive, very time consuming, and, uh, and, and creates an issue. Now you mentioned that the voters should have a very broad basis for, for judging uh, whether to, to keep a judge or not. Would you consider that an appropriate basis for someone to run against a sitting judge? Well, uh you know, I think that story identifies some of the dangers of relying on elections to select judges. And as I said, I like the federal model. But, I mean, here in Florida, you have a system where voters are given input, and I think they have every right to um, assess whether they think the judge is making the same decisions that they would make on these hot-button Issues. I mean, we all know that the Constitution is vague on these questions. It says due process, equal protection. It could mean anything. And I think the voters have a right to say, no, you're too far off the reservation. Um, and, and that's why I don't like elected systems. But I think some of those same issues are brought up even in, in the Florida system for appellate judges because these judges are raising a lot of money. And it, it raises some of those same questions of appearances of impropriety and what have you that are faced when you have contested elections. And so that's why I like the federal method. And I did want to just say one more thing um, in response to what Professor Hawkins, or um, uh, President Hawkins said. He made a very good point, which is, which, which is that in all of these systems, in all of these systems, lawyers are involved. Um, in the federal system, the president has a whole office, office of the White House counsel that's helping him. I, my objection is not to involving lawyers. But there's a difference between the governor picking the lawyers and the bar picking the lawyers. 
One special interest group chooses the lawyers. It's different than someone who's been elected by the entire state or the entire country picking the lawyers. So nothing wrong with lawyers, but it's who selects the lawyers that concerns me. Yes. I had a question, I guess, for the professor. You said you kind of favor the federal system, but if, you know, here in Florida, circuit judges, county court judges are elected by the people. They're not appointed. They don't sit for mayor for detention or selection. But appellate judges, both uh, district courts and the Supreme Court, are appointed in that way. So if you advocate a federal system, are you advocating lifetime appointments for better, for appellate judges and Supreme Court judges? It seems to be in contradiction to your concept that then the people have the right to vote them in or out, because in the federal system, they don't. So is that the same system you're advocating here for Florida on the appellate level? For purposes of the tape, do we need to repeat the question, or did you put um, the, the, the question, if I can capture the essence, was, uh, Professor, uh, you, you seem to be advocating a federal system that, that includes uh, lifetime tenure, yet at the same time, you seem to be advocating a system where voters under a retention or election system uh, should be able to, to cast a vote to remove a judge um, on a very broad uh, basis, um, um, uh, including we just disagreed with the rulings is there a contradiction in, in that if I captured the essence of the question? So what I would say is there's a difference between a judge that's appointed by the governor, for example, or the president, whose hands have not been tied by a commission that is stuffed with bar people, um, uh, and a, a situation where the governor has uh, a commission tying his hands, and the commission is stuffed by bar people. Now, you know, President Hawkins is right. As I said, Florida's not as bad as some states. You only give, you know, 44 point something percent of the commission to the bar here. You don't give 50 or 60 or 70 percent like you do in some states. So it's not as bad as it could be. But to reserve all those spots for one special interest group, it makes things difficult for the governor, I think, uh, to get who, um, who the governor would want. And, but I will say this, my own personal preference is to have a system where um, you do have a federal method but without life tenure. Because I, I do think that giving a judge a job for life creates bad incentives. And I think every few years, uh, 10 years, 14 years long term, the judge should come back before the governor or the president uh, and the Senate uh, to get renominated and reconfirmed. I think that's a good balance between accountability and independence. I think the current federal system goes a little too far towards, towards independence. Please. Hi. My question is for uh, Mr. Hawkins. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, uh, judges can't campaign, uh, that, that their hands are tied as far as the contesting issue. Um, but in fact, I belong to a, uh, I guess it's sort of a union, the Florida Bar. I have to belong to it to practice law in Florida, whether I want to or not. And the Florida Bar, as a surrogate for the sitting judges who that are up for merit retention, um, seems to be doing a forceful job of acting on their behalf. Um, and I wondered if you thought that was a, a rational way for those of us who may not agree with that position uh, to have our, our dues and our um, our fourth membership handled. Good question. Oh. Uh, the Florida Bar's focus on the merit retention election uh, is reflective of a 30 year commitment to voter education. So, this has been something that the Florida Bar has done uh, since merit retention elections went into place in 1976. Uh, the Florida Bar has worked very, very hard to present an educational oriented view on the system. Uh, what do judges do? What, do? what is the merit retention issue about? How did we get here? What is the, what is the process about? Uh, there appears to be no other body, frankly, in our state willing to talk about the issue. So. Uh, we have as one of our missions the improvement of the administration of justice. That's 
part of your pledge when you join the Florida Bar. The Florida Bar is an integrated bar. In Florida, that means in Florida, we oversee licensure, we oversee education. You cannot practice within the state of Florida unless you're a member of the Florida Bar, and it's been that way since its formation, I think, in 1952. In New York, there are a few states where it's different, uh, but it's been that way for a very long time. Um, we have worked very hard to not represent in this program support for one particular justice or judge, for one particular court or position. We do think, though, we have an obligation to try to educate. And we do think, though, that if somebody's not going to step forward and provide that education, you tell me of a body that's otherwise educated in an organized way, I'll look at it. But in our studies, there are none. And we frankly think we would be under tremendous criticism from our bar membership if we didn't come forward and say, voters, this is what this is about. This is gravely important. I mean, you're talking about constitutional officers. You're talking about people who day in and day out have to make very, very important decisions on what comes into evidence and how do you apply law. These are very, very vital roles. And somebody needs to talk in a balanced, informed way about the importance of this vote. And the Florida Bar Board of Governors, 52 members, about half of whom are from the other party, you probably didn't realize that, that may make Florida unique, but they voted to, to go this way. Now, if you have a question about your dues, call the Florida Bar. There are ways to be exempted. I'm not advocating that. Every year we have you know, a small percentage of folks say, I don't want my dues used in this way. But um, overwhelmingly from our membership, the support has been, you know, thank you for being so organized this year. But again, this is something that we've been doing for the last 35 years since merit retention went into place by the voters electing to put it in place. Good question. Thank you. Please, please do. Uh, I just got a quick question. I heard uh, Mr. Hawkins, and I, I understand what you're saying, um, but your name is um, Fitzpatrick. Fitz, Fitz, Fitz um, I agree with almost 99% of what you said. But there was some ambiguity, uh, and maybe it's on my part, if you can correct that. At one point, you advocated that the people should have a choice on who the judges should be. And then at the end, you advocated that it should be a federal system. Okay? Now, as for me, like in Florida, maybe this is maybe another topic, judges can't, now correct me if I'm wrong on this, judges can't get up there and tell the public when they're running what their political uh, leaning is. They can't do it. So in my opinion, that's the reason why many people don't even vote for judges, okay? And when you do see a judge, you figure out, okay, what, okay this person is a nice person, okay? Got a family, had a business, so what? So does millions of other people. I wanna know, what is their worldview? Where do they lean? Are they liberal, conservative, libertarian, whatever? See? But for you, if you can just clear that up in my mind a little bit. Is that, yes. you see what I'm saying? Okay, thank you. I, um, sorry if, if, I, if I wasn't clear on that. Um, I do want to say, though, that when I was a law clerk for Justice Scalia, the justice wrote an opinion in a case called Republican Party of Minnesota v. White five to four where he held, the court held, that you do have the right to tell voters your views on all of those things per the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Um, and we struck down the ABA canon that had been used in lots of states. There's a new ABA canon now. I think it's just as unconstitutional as the, as the last one. Um, but I think judges do have the right to tell voters. Judges don't want to tell voters because they've loved for years being able to say, I can't tell you where I stand on any of these issues. <laughs> it's been very convenient, very convenient. But, um, so I think I would rather have my judges accountable to the public than to the, to the bar. Um, but there's a couple of ways to do public accountability. One way is direct accountability with people voting. The other way is indirect public accountability where the public's views are filtered through elected officials. 
and I prefer the elected officials route because I personally believe that voters are not in the best position to judge the worldviews and other judicial philosophy questions that judges, uh, they need to confront in order to select judges. I think it'd be better to have elected officials who can rely on legal staffs do that. Um, but in Florida, you're stuck with a system where you have the retention vote, and I think it should be used in a coherent way. I, uh, I think we have time for one more question. Rocky, did your hand go up? Thank you, and I, I really appreciate uh, the, the quality of the discussion because I think that you've really hit all the important issues. I have a couple observations and, and I appreciate comments from both speakers on it. One, I've been involved in judicial selection both advising a governor and as part of a JNC and as part of a voter. And I can tell you that I feel utterly incompetent in voting on a judge unless I personally know them. And uh, if, if there were a system where people would fill out the same kind of application that they have to submit for the JNC process, I'd feel a lot better about having an election or even a merit retention, but most of us don't have enough information. And the reality is the people who control judicial elections are newspapers. And if you don't want the bar controlling elections, I don't think we want newspapers controlling <laughs> elections either. Um, and by the way, there is politicking at every level, even when there's governor appointment, there's politicking, presidential appointment, there's politicking. Let's not kid ourselves. But um, I really do resent the fact that the bar takes a position that there is no basis on which to vote, no legitimate basis to vote against merit retention simply because you disagree with the worldview of a judge and how they approach. I think there are legitimate disagreements that can occur that are ethical and don't violate your oath as an attorney or the independence of the judiciary. But I think we could eliminate all this, and this is what I'd like both of you to comment on. And rather than go to the extreme of a lifetime tenure, which I think is also a bad idea, what about having term limits for judges? A, leg a reasonable term limit, 12 years, 15 years, some period like that where you're not dissuading very successful lawyers from applying, but you're also uh, not subjecting them to elections or to the uh, merit retention uncertainty, uh, and you're not subjecting them to the political process. Because I think it's also dangerous to have a judge have to come before a, a governor or a legislature to justify the remaining on the court. So what do you think about just give them 10 or 12 years, some reasonable period, and then they can go back uh, to being a law professor or uh, a lawyer or do something else or apply for some other position? You know, I'm thinking of a, uh, an analogy, and I guess in the bankruptcy arena, bankruptcy judges are appointed for nine years by the president, and then 14, and then their terms come to an end. It's by the, sorry to interrupt, it's by the circuit court here, for example, they're appointed by the 11th Circuit. I think that's an interesting idea. I, 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 I don't really have any expertise to draw on, but I think that's an interesting idea. I, I, this, is, this is a different, a difficult question that the, the voters are asked to deal with. This was, system was put in place because the prior system was deemed to have failed with uh, candidates for the high court campaigning across the state, raising vast sums of money, just like somebody running for agriculture commissioner. Not to disparage that, but that was the milieu that existed, which was the backdrop that led to the constitutional amendment. And remember, you know, amending the constitution of a state is not an easy thing to do. So that our citizens overwhelmingly chose that is, cannot be ignored. So I think to, to go the route suggested would be something worth considerable study because it, it may lead to, there would be a degree of political insulation you know, once the governor makes the appointment. And so I think that has merit worth contemplating. Um, I think you would have to have a constitutional amendment though. So, and that in and of itself could be an interesting exercise in, you know, constitutional politics to have that, that national debate or the statewide debate. I, I do want to observe that in the JNC process today, the bar nominates its four JNC candidates, and I think it has to present 
three or six for each seat, and then the governor selects of the group. And if the governor doesn't like any of the nominees, the governor can reject all six and request new nominees. And that's happened. How long does that go on for? Can it keep rejecting? Uh, it can go on for a while. I, I can't give you the term, but I think it can go on and on, actually. Um, I could be mistaken on that. Anyway, that, that's my answer to your question. I think it's a great question. I think it's a great idea. I do think a limited long term would be preferable to life tenure. My own personal preference would be to do a renewable term where you did have to go back to the governor and serve, say, another 12 years. And that's just because I would strike the balance, I think, between judicial independence and democratic accountability a little further on the side of democratic accountability. I, I think it is something of a good thing to have a judge with a long term that gives them a little bit of insulation, but also to have to care to some extent how their decisions are going to be received by the people that they're supposed to be serving. I don't think it's necessarily bad to have it at least in the back of the judge's mind that someone one day may not like what I'm about to do here. I, I, you know, that doesn't mean uh, the judge needs to be beholden to the public or running an election every year, but just have it in the back of their mind a little bit. I'm a little more comfortable with that than saying 12 years, no one can touch you and do whatever you want to. But that's a very good, I, I still think it's a good idea compared to life tenure. Well, I want to, uh, uh, I, I want to thank both our, our speakers tonight. And before, uh, before I ask Jefferson to close, I just want to, uh, to restate the obvious, which is that this is a timely issue. Um, um, whether you view retention as a, an almost a JQC light or a much broader basis and, and irrespective of how you view um, your, your, your view of what is a dependent judiciary, um, you know, I, I think this is a good start to, to studying an important issue and an issue that, that I encourage everyone to think about um, because it is relevant to the November ballot. With that, Jefferson. Thank you, Dean. A couple of closing remarks. One thing nobody's talked about is uh, the very hotly contested uh, Supreme Court election for the state of Wisconsin a few months ago. It made the headlines and there were crazy things going on. There was a, uh, I believe, a female sitting justice challenging the sitting chief justice to replace him and there were allegations of screaming, shouting, cursing, pushing, shoving, hair pulling, crazy things. <laughs> Nobody's talked about the entertainment value of that. <laughs> Thank you for coming again. Be sure and turn in your badges. Uh, this was Judge Fajardo's innovation. It was an excellent idea. We had a good problem tonight. We had uh, a lot of people RSVPing at the last minute, so we had to produce more um, uh, blank badges. Claudia went out and got those. Uh, Claudia, be sure and submit your reimbursement form for that. And uh, finally, the panel has obviously done an outstanding job. I got a lot of congratulations. For selecting this panel, again, Jennifer's help was invaluable. Jennifer Guy, you should stand. Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer is an experienced and knowledgeable and thoughtful student of public policy in the state of Florida. If she doesn't know anything about it, it's probably not worth knowing. And uh, also, I'd like to thank the panelists. I spoke to Mr. Hawkins on the phone. I know Alex. I spoke to him in person, traded emails with Professor Fitzpatrick. All of them have one thing in common. They immediately, with that hesitation, accepted our invitation. We thank them for that. Finally, I spoke last time we were here in May about a, an event with John Yu in November. It turns out we, there was a miscalculation. That cannot happen in November. So as of today, we have nothing else on the calendar for the rest of the year. We're talking about putting something together. Uh, stay tuned for perhaps an event in late November or early December. And again, thank you so much for coming. I encourage you to join the society. It's only 50 bucks. And if you're a law student, it's five. <laughs> thank you very much. Turn in your name tags as you're